am um, coordinator and co-founder of Art Action UK, and um, we're just going to talk a little bit about the um, history of Art Action UK, and then also we are very, very lucky to have Joy Kawakubo yeah. and Gabrielle Hurst and Warren Harper yeah, as a you know, uh, contributor <coughs> speaker. And um, I'm, I'm going to introduce them to you in due course. And about first of all, um, the housekeeping. Yeah. Um, if in case of fire, yeah, and can step. So we, uh, in orderly manner, if we could just um, yeah, don't run, but just in calm, we go go out that way. And also, toilet is through that door next to the kitchen. And so you're welcome to use those facilities and. Also, we are very, very um, grateful for that for the X yeah, um, to actually um, give us this opportunity to you know, host this event. Um, we have a quite um, long history with that for the X, where um, even at the beginning of 2012, when we started at Art Action UK, that uh, for the X was the first to basically come and say, "Look, you know, we, we can help." You know, so it was um, really nice to be able to go, come back to the home, as it were to be able to actually do this event. You know, so I really you know, thank you, you know, very much. And um, so we're just going to tell you a little bit about Art Action UK. Yeah, no? Yeah. Um, so uh, as you all know, in 2011, actually today, um, there was a big um, earthquake and tsunami uh, struck northeast coast of Japan. And a lot of people died directly from, obviously, tsunami. Um, not too many uh, people actually um, <coughs> That died or injured by the earthquake itself, you know, but um, there's a basically huge, uh, big disaster. Um, but one of the specific things that is um, linked to this particular disaster is that you know, that disaster uh, triggered um, nuclear um, fallout disaster, which is said to be uh, level seven, which is equivalent to Chernobyl disaster. <coughs> Historically, it's one of the biggest nuclear disaster recorded. Um, um, so, it's in UK, you don't hear very much about um, Fukushima anymore. It's you know, it's a long time ago. You know, it's eight years now. Today is exactly eight years uh, from the actual um, earthquake and tsunami, and then the um, fallout. Um, um, disaster happened at Fukushima in, um, on the 15th. Yeah. So that the, uh, sequence of events you know, took place. Um, I'm not going to go into that technical side of things, you know, but um, it's, you don't hear very much about it, you know, but it's still not um, contained, as it were, um, and it's still an ongoing problem. And, and what we wanted to do with Art Action UK uh, is that um, it's not just simply to um, kind of stand against uh, in front of the uh, government building to uh, shout um, anti-nuke uh, kind of um, demonstration, which uh, our friends actually are doing. You know, but um, because we are an artist, and we also kind of see much more nuanced situation of uh, the situation, um, which isn't just that you know, event and the particular government that was bad, and you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, so there's much more kind of a systematic and, and bigger problem that we are actually <coughs> in. And uh, so, we, uh, so we are aware of that. You know, so we, and also, because we are an artist, you know, we can have a kind of means to change the government or change the whole you know, um, nuclear, you know, industry or anything like that. You know, so we, we sort of started to think about the way that we can engage as an artist. And so we started to actually um, bring artists from um, Japan originally to um, come over here to have a conversation about the situation. And one of the artists uh, who won the residence, so we uh, advertised in Japan, recruit artists, and then basically selected artists um, per year to bring them over to have that um, uh, conversation and exhibitions and you know, uh, event like this. And 2015, yes, yes, that, uh, Joy was one of that artists who won that award 
come over here, and uh, we really happy that he's here with us. Yeah, and then we also had Kaya Hanasaki in 2012, where uh, she talked about this uh, local people's uh, dilemma about breathing uh, the air, which um, they some of them actually trust the government. Uh, uh, guideline to say it's safe, you know, but some people actually have deep-rooted um, kind of suspicion about the government policies, you know, so then um, this idea of to wear the mask or not to wear the mask become a kind of political act, um, although, you know, actually wearing a mask doesn't actually prevent <laughs> anything very much, you know, but um, it, uh, so the yeah, kind of idea has um, used that as a kind of tool to have a conversation about um, sort of basic human right by in breathing. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of an interesting project, which um, she has done with lots of people to uh, discuss about the situation. So, you know, what would you do if you are in that situation? And then, you know, people then kind of ask to take the portrait of people with wearing masks. You know, so those are kind of uh, activities that yeah. and, um, took place in here in the UK, you know, and the artists came over you know, from Japan. In 2013, uh, Hikaru Fuji, um, he um, has been documenting of that, the whole region, uh, and he's a um, quite uh, well-regarded film artist. And he came here and shown a couple of different places, including Four Corners and um, Hasking and East London, and we also went up to York University to show um, his piece. And he's, um, becoming quite big um, and well um, regarded artist in Japan. Well, he, he always has been that uh, since he's come back to Japan and, and raising a lot of issues uh, to do with that. Yeah. And then uh, 2015's Joy and in 2016, um, Kim Chome um, came and they have done an exhibition here. They were quite interesting artists, again, to uh, deal with um, subject matter, which is quite serious, you know, but in a very kind of um, humorous way. Mm -hmm. And um, so you could actually look at Kim Chome, you know, maybe uh, their, their website and highlights in a couple of different um, projects that they're, they're working on. Yeah. Yeah. And then 2014, we had a Komori and Salt sale, and they, they're actually uh, becoming really, really popular now at the moment in Japan because. Um, They've been doing lots of activities in a local area and, and to kind of uh, support people and listen and archive um, the local people's voices, which is not um, recorded uh, by you know, either a journalism you know, or the governmental bodies you know, because uh, some of those kind of utterance that local people are uh, sharing with the artists are not something that is officially they would um, take it, you know, as an opinion, you know, because it, um, there's a kind of difficulty in, in um, expressing those ideas. And then, um, sorry, sorry, yeah, so, yeah, figure about, yeah, to, uh, Yumi Song was, uh, was here in uh, 2017, um, a Korean uh, Japanese artist who's also uh, working within the uh, area of Fukushima, you know, um, but the area that she worked in is just one area that is kind of uh, avoided the contamination. You know, um, but that also created lots of interesting kind of um, issues of um, place that is used as a propaganda by the government that you know, they say come and you know, eat everything, that's fine, because that is safe. Yeah. Um, so it's true. <laughs> you know, um, but then you have to go through the contaminated area to get to this. You know, um, retreat village, you know, so their, their uh, business is all kind of totally obliterated because nobody would come and visit their uh, hot spring uh, hotel resorts. Um, so there's a kind of interesting thing that she was kind of, um, at, and also uh, as a Korean Japanese, um, there's a lot of discrimination that you know, came out you know, from the experience that she was trying to help and contribute to things. So that also brought out um, other kind of interesting angle about this post Fukushima uh, political landscape. And then um, 2018, you know, it's only just half a year ago, um, Pontaro Dokiana uh, was here, yeah, and he also had a discussion event. And then 
yeah. So this is also so what we uh, do at actually UK, we basically bring artists over here and have discussions and uh, exhibitions and conferences, workshops. And also, you know, some this is a couple of years ago, CSM students involved in fundraising and also we've done lots of workshops to do with art and anthropocene and the student actually then developed their own work to exhibit at, uh, at Central St. Martin and the link in exhibition space for the street. Thank you. So that's what we do and I'm going to uh, ask um, each artist and researcher to actually, uh, by means, means of kind of introducing themselves, you know, I'm going to ask them to actually talk about their work. So 10 minutes each, you know, quickly. And then what we're going to do is to open up the conversation, the conversation and then eventually we will you know, open up um, the conversation to the floor. And, and after that, uh, what we're hoping to do, uh, to kind of give yourself you know, you so enough time to mingle in a meeting with you know, each other, and also you know, there's some food and drinks here, and, you know, so that you can actually kind of relax and have a discussion with others. Uh, um, artists and researchers who are here, but also the contributors. Um, um, if I could also ask, I mean, uh, you have already paid to come in here, you know, so you're free to eat and drink, you know, but if you feel that you know, you know, this event has actually offered you so much and you know, also you know, enjoy the food, and if you want to give, you, you know, your donations are also very welcome, you know, because what you really have to understand is that uh, this is, in a way, how we managed to do this eight years. You know, we, we are not getting any funding from anybody, yeah, but through the artist's power you know, and our little you know, students' kind of power, <laughs> we managed to do. And the, the reason being is that, um, especially now in Japan, <coughs> there's a lot of funding that's actually being offered uh, from the central government, especially going towards 2020 Olympics. Um, and they want to basically uh, give very good impression <coughs> of Japan and all the nuclear uh, problems are kind of being subsided and it's okay. You know, so anybody who <laughs> wants to talk about something that is actually even remotely questioning of that isn't going to get any funding. You know, so therefore, there's no point even um, for me to make any application for um, uh, Japanese funding. Yeah, and also if I did get that, then I know the fact that could potentially um, jeopardize the freedom of you know, um, artists who wants to maybe talk about question um, you know, so we, we've sort of been quite careful not to, in a way, um, use the funding that is, and also you know, there's lots of other artists who are actually sent from um, sort of central government funding to be able to share lots of other Japanese wonderful you know, cultural uh, things. You know, but we are doing something a little bit more kind of um, obscure. <laughs> Different, you know, so that's how it works. You know, so your contribution, even just few you know, pounds, a few you know, uh, coins into that red uh, donation bucket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, 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 uh, it's very, very, very well. Um, if you don't have um, any cash and you still feel like you would like to somehow get involved and um, contribute, you could actually go onto Art Action UK website and go to uh, get involved click the bottom at the top, and then um, donate now comes up. You know, so you, you know, you're very welcome to take part. Okay, thank you. So now I'm going to pass yeah, um, this to yeah. Joy. Yeah. Yes. So, um, Joy is um, Spanish-born yes. Japanese artist, yeah. now based in London and uh, Tokyo. Yeah. Yeah. I understand you just literally come back from Tokyo. Um, not uh, literally, but almost. Yeah. Um, yeah that's a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me and thank you all for coming. I think it's, it's a very uh, important and interesting time to talk about many issues that uh, usually we don't, we, we, we don't have an know so much present uh, when we speak or act. So well, I don't know how many people know my work. So I will start with a very rough introduction of myself. Um, kind of a 
super rough <laughs> in the sense that it starts very back in time. But yeah, today I was thinking of, of talking about time and the time, time span of, uh, that we are facing when, when we, we start dealing with uh, issues that are like uh, nuclear or atomic energy or even when, when we think about uh, uh, the present day. So there are different, I think, uh, time spans that are overlapping each other, human lifetime, uh, um, geographical time scales, and of course, uh, spatial or, or astronomical uh, lifetime. So yeah, 13 billion years ago, well, that's very far, but yeah, it all started, everyone. So that's common to us, I guess, yes. <laughs> it's a presentation of all of us together. Then, well, until quite recently, we were all together in this slide, probably. So you are all the same. <clears throat> was um, 70, 74 years ago, we have the, the, the Manhattan Project that uh, kind of created the first atomic bomb and also the, the first, um, well, yeah. Uh, nuclear uh, weapon. <coughs> then I was born in Spain. Uh, 33 years ago, the Chernobyl disaster happened. 15 years ago, I moved to Japan and studied there. And then I, yeah, I studied psychology. Then I did uh, finances. I was also a house husband. And then I started uh, photography and then art. So kind of that in a very short span <laughs> in this timeline. And then nine years ago, there was a Great East uh, uh, Japan. Oh, great! It's <laughs> double great. Sorry, it's a it's a misspelling. It's not so great. Actually. <laughs> but it was uh, a big earthquake <laughs> and the collapse of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, which was a quite um, a big event in my life. And uh, it made me change a lot my words also. And as, uh, as a result, I also participated four or five years ago in, in the Art Action UK residency. And as a result, now I move here with my family and I'm yeah, living here in the UK. So it's quite a, quite a yeah, um, how do you call it? You may take it uh, like, uh, like life changing. It was a lot, quite a life changing uh, residency, I think. Yeah. So. Um, <coughs> Uh, it might be a little bit of a tangential start, but uh, some people may know the current emperor of Japan is abdicating next month and uh, ending the period of time known as the Heisei period that has been 30 years. So in Japan, you may not know, but uh, they, we have a, like a Japanese um, time uh, calendar. Yeah. So in every bureaucratic or every official paper, instead of 2019, you have to write the 30th of the Heisei or whatever. So uh, it's very complicated. Well, but people are used to deal with both. Uh, and these Heisei period, uh, these periods in Japan are marked by the life or and death of the emperor. So now the, the current um, emperor of Japan, uh, started his, Heise, uh, his uh, reign uh, 30 years ago when the Showa, the Emperor Hirohito, uh, died in 1989. And since then, it's been the Heisei period. So in Japan this year, there is in television, there is all sorts of things about how was the Heisei period and things like that. So it's, uh, if you imagine that uh, when, when Queen Elizabeth uh, is uh, abdicating or perhaps uh, changing the reign to uh, uh, to the next um, how do you call it monarch. Uh, monarch yes probably there will be a lot of media um, uh, how do you call it uh, like uh, when you highlighting of coverage. what yeah, covering of what has been her reign so in the same manner in Japan there is a lot of uh, media coverage mm -hmm. about this. And um, although, um, although my parents are Japanese, I grew up in Spain, so I'm not so much attached, particularly attached to the, to the Japanese imperial family or the Japanese time nomenclature or the Heisei period itself. But uh, for me, 
during the Heisei period, the most um, big event that has happened is the, the Paul mentioned uh, Fukushima nuclear event uh, in March of, the, uh, of 2011 and the consequent collapse of the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear plant. And um, so many artists at the time that experienced the, uh, at the time experienced the catastrophe in Japan and felt compelled to act for relief as well as uh, social and politically uh, to, to break with the social conformism that has been reigning in Japan for more than 50 years. And in 2014, Prime Minister Abe announced the resuming of operation of the nuclear power plants in Japan that had been stopped during the three years after uh, 2011. And with this remark, the actual price of the uranium that had been declining since the nuclear accident in Fukushima turned upward. And the memory of a major accident that gave a glimpse of, of the enormous risk of the vulnerability of the system was almost forgot in only three years. So I just thought, what would happen after 20 years? So this may be the, sh the same that happened uh, in Chernobyl, that happened uh, um, in 1986, so it's almost 40 years ago. And uh, it happened at the end of the Showa period, and, and now it's almost forgotten in Japan. So looking back on the history of nuclear power, gen uh, nuclear power Major, major accidents in the international atomic evaluation scale, uh, accidents of level six or more have happened every, about once every 20 or 30 years. And I started thinking about the reason of this, this periodicity, periodicity and um, I reached one of uh, the conclusions that this oblivion is due to a kind of a generation change, or generation shift in, in in, in the population in Japan. So I started up works, one of the series of works that I started is called The Nuclear Age, and uh, which I got the production in 2011, but I didn't uh, actually present it, or it's not been published anywhere uh, fully uh, yet. So it is a project to shoot uh, all existing nuclear power plants in Japan in a state of idle or complete stop. So all the photographed um, uh, nuclear plants are in complete uh, uh, stop uh, state. And uh, the photographs are taken with large, uh, large format color film. And all the shooting of this project was finished in 2016. Most of the work is scheduled to be released in 2031. So my son, the reason is that my son, who was one year old when the accident of the Fukushima nuclear power plant occurred, will have reached adulthood in 2031, and will get the right to vote around that age. And uh, imagining that almost no information about this Fukushima accident may remain in the media at the time when they have to make decisions as voters who, bear, who, who are the, the people that uh, bear the future of Japan, if Japan continues to be a democracy, which, who knows. <laughs> um, so I decided to create a record of the existing nuclear power plants in Japan as a documentation of their current state. So um, there is a ritual uh, in Japanese Shinto tradition to dismantle every shrine in, in a period of every thir uh, 20 years, usually, sometimes 30, and rebuild it again. So this is not a ceremony to solve the technical problems of the buildings, but I, I think this uh, happens more for, for the Mia carpenters, which, is, which are the shrine or temple uh, builders, carpenters, that are artisans, basically. So for them to, to pass the know-how into the next generation uh, of, of the apprentice, uh, apprentices, um, so in that sense, I think that art can have also a different pro propagation um, time span or property <coughs> uh, compared to uh, activism or period, um, journalism or uh, mass media. So I just thought that I would like to fill this gap of, of generation of Libyan uh, by making my work public in 
20 years later, which well, mass media or journalistic coverage would have been, uh, uh, how do you say, when it's uh, in, decline. So in, decline. in decline, for example. Yeah, so it, it were probably it had, uh, artwork in a, in a different time span. So in Japan, in the case of Japan, the time, the, um, this time shift periods in Japan are closely related to the biological death of the emperor, for example, in terms of calendar. Uh, which is a, a, a very human uh, um, <coughs> measure, like when instead of measuring things by meters, you go by feet, or, or I think that's very human in a way. So, uh, in that sense, I was compelled to think about uh, not only human-based time spans, but also in a broader um, field of view. And uh, this change, well, the, the intersection of periods when the Heisei period ends and the new period is starting probably marks, in a way, a place where people can uh, uh, reset records, memories, or even traditions, and things can be subverted, and many, many things can be manipulated also, but also, uh, like naming a period, like giving a name to a period, it's a, it's a very, uh, I think, a political art. And, uh, but when we think of, of different uh, time spans, uh, I think we have to be more radical in the way we, we think. So for example, uh, if we, um, the cesium-137 is a radioactive element with relatively long half-life, and it's 30 years, and this is the main source of long-term contamination after atmospheric <coughs> tests of tests of atomic bombs or nuclear accidents of like Fukushima and uh, along with uh, strontium-19 also and a handful of uh, plutonium isotopes it's the principal source of radiation uh, waste for the next hundred years or so and of course we have plutonium, uranium and then in a genetic time scale for example uh, I came recently with a, uh, an article uh, that was um, explaining the research of, of a Russian artist called Dmitry Belyayev and they, in a re that he in a recent investigation carried on an experiment of breeding wild foxes to produce a group of friendly domesticated foxes who displayed behavioral, ph physiological and anatomical characteristics that were not found in the wild population or were found uh, in wild foxes, but with much lower frequency. So, well, it was like domesticated uh, foxes that were like dogs, like really liking people, not like the wild foxes that are afraid of human beings. So, so 40 generations of lineage is the time that it took to achieve this mutational or genetic change. And then I just thinking about like, basing on the assumption that 40 generations of lineage is the shortest time in that species could kind of show significant changes. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, two slides more, well, three actually. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, any, well, I just think, I was just thinking, yeah, that, um, yeah, Usually it takes like 10, uh, 1,000 years to, to have this kind of genetical change, but actu actually radiation can cause this like instantaneously less than a second, and uh, the, the results could be like uh, more long term, like cancer or or <coughs> even uh, mutations that are uh, hereditary. So the the problem is. It's, uh, it's like an accident. It, it can be happen any time, but it takes a long time to to be uh, present. And one thing that I was thinking also in terms of time is the, this is a, a psychological uh, interesting fact about how humans confront and accept, accept adversities and changes in life. And it's called Kubler-Ross Green Curve, and it shows the main stages of accepting a loss or adverse event in life. And after my experience in Japan at the time of the accident, I felt that this model can also be adapted not only to individuals, because this is uh, mainly for individual pe people, persons, but also adapted to the social mood of the Japanese society 
and in the whole, the whole, the, the communities engaged uh, globally in dealing with the nuclear crisis. So in this thing, I think that probably we should be around this area, or perhaps frustration. Well, probably it will take a long time until we can kind of see these events as something positive that made us change in, in, a, in a more positive manner. But usually it starts with a shock, uh, denial, like, no, it, it's not possible. That c could have, couldn't happen to me. Then it's uh, frustration. Uh, that is like, oh, why me? And, and, and yeah, blame the other people. And then it's like, oh, no, <laughs> time. They probably will not be in this, in this period, perhaps. And then, then it's the time when we can start experimenting other, other uh, possible futures and other options for life. And then, yeah, eventually people uh, start mm, making decisions and kind of incorporating these life events in their, in their lives. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a good time frame for now to start thinking seriously about yeah, the future and how we should act. Uh, well, and in a time that in Japan mass media is trying to kind of distract a lot of this attention into Olympics and more kind of uh, happy um, <coughs> news. Uh, so, yeah, uh, finally to end it, uh, coming back to these vortexes where records, information and generations change and shift, I think that we should uh, start to think the collapse of the nuclear <coughs> reactor in Fukushima as a good proof of the risk that we confront when fueling the, currently, uh, the current energy system, that in my point of view is the most straightforward example of capitalistic uh, cost efficiency policy present in most uh, societies, Western societies. Um, I want to close my remark with a quest quotation from Groucho Marx that I think it speaks for itself. Uh, Learn the, from the mistakes of the others. You can never live long enough to make them all yourself. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you to our uh, next uh, contributor, Gabriela Andros. Yeah, so if you could just uh, set things up. And, uh, Gabriela is a um, researcher and also an artist. And, uh, she's based in London, apparently. Um, but, uh, Do you want to move here? She's originally from Aust yeah. Sydney, Australia. Um, currently, um, she's a fellow at the Bomb Factory Studio, which is very close to CSF Road and in North London. And, and Gabriela works with film, installation and performance and bio art mm. to untangle romantic association between art history and landscape. And her current performative research project, How to Make a Bomb, yeah, uh, circu uh, circulate around the specific breed of rose cultivated and registered with a common name, Rosa Atom Bomb, uh, in 1953. Is that right? Yes. yes. And so, so Gabriela uh, is researching possible links and associations between uh, botanical and nuclear fields. Um, hello, everybody. Hello. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and um, for allowing me to put my project within this context. I mean, I think um, I think I guess at the base of my project is trying to kind of put it within general, broader nuclear contexts. Um, um, and so. Um, I'm going to start with this image that um, I guess is um, it's a portrait of m my brain um, and with my research on this project and um, you'll notice that at the middle of this picture I have um, circled the atom bomb rose and so the atom bomb rose is um, is a research project um, and is an actual object by which I am looking into really much more expanded fields of the nuclear. Um, and uh, it's a durational performance project. Um, and. Um, and the Art Action UK 
hopefully is going to take part. Yeah, and it is connected. Now I'm kind of working with various different people and Art Action UK and also Warren, and we'll talk about that afterwards. Um, so, um, The, oh, sorry. So, um, as a, so, the atom bomb rose is a species of rose that was um, released onto the market in 1953. Its um, full name is the Floribund, um, Floribunda, um, Rosa Floribunda atom bomb. Its common name is atom bomb, and these uh, names. Um, they're also called fancy names. They're names which um, rose breeders, once they've produced a, a new species of rose that's distinct visually from another species of rose, they will give this name to that species of rose and it's usually as a marketing strategy um, so that that rose can be presented to a larger market. So it often, it might be something very um, benign such as calling a daffodil uh, honey drops so that when you buy it as a bulb, you get an idea of what this rose, this plant is going to be when it's in bloom. Um, but also in the case, um, particularly of roses, um, they can be named after um, monumental political events at the time. Um, in the case of uh, my research before this, I was looking at plants which were named after battles and acts of military violence. That's how I started down this path. Um, and I became really interested in these plants that were called verdun or solferino um, and the act of what it would mean to actually tend these plants in a garden um, and to confront um, the histories that they represent or that they carry on but also an act of caring that comes with gardening those plants and also my act of controlling those plants, pruning them, tending them and what that means, what, what that is as a process. And then I came across this rose, this atom bomb rose and that just kind of seem to incorporate, that just seemed to kind of push this research into a very kind of whole new field, even, or just like exacerbate this particular tenderness, violence kind of um, combination that came with these types of plants. Um, so I started researching this particular rose. And when I say I came across it, I came across it in the course of my research. Um, and I found out that it was made and released by a German rose breeder called Raymond Cordes, who's a big German rose, who's a big international rose breeder from a long dynasty of rose breeders um, in Germany. He made it in 1953, and it was wildly successful on the market at first. Um, and then soon afterwards, uh, it almost completely disappeared from the market. It became very unpopular. Um, so some reasons about why someone would call a rose atom bomb, um, there's, I haven't been able to find anything conclusive, so it's all speculative, but that um, there was uh, this atom bomb mania about um, uh, the bikini, for example, swimsuit being named after a bikini at toll tests, um, I guess a kind of hope about the nuclear age, what that could mean for the future, but um, either way, um, that popularity and craze kind of disappeared and with it the popularity of this rose as a garden rose. So by the time I started looking for a specific specimen to look after, it was very difficult. Um, it seemed that there were only four nurseries, sorry, not nurseries, um, rose collections, gardens in Europe um, that have one registered and no commercial nurseries at all um, seem to have any available. Um, and But I was lucky enough that this particular garden in um, Italy called the Feneschi Gardens, after I kind of ended up kind of getting in touch with them and talking with them and telling them about my research, they offered to craft me at this, from their single specimen that they have, um, a, 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 my own and bomb rose. And um, so that kind of was happening and because it takes two years for that to happen, I kind of moved on with my research then I get, um, I get an email two years later being like, Dear Gabriella Hurst, your Adam Bond Rose is ready to be sent to you in the next two weeks. Please invoice us for, we're invoicing you for 50 pounds. Like, it just suddenly was all go. And so um, it couldn't be sent to Britain because of certain restrictions in importing plants. And so I needed to go back to Germany where I'd been living before this to pick it up. So I went to Britain. Um, picked up this plant that was in a state of dormancy so I could move with it um, and I took it in my hand luggage back to 
the UK. And there was a kind of interesting thing that came out of this process. Um, although it is legal to bring plants that have been cultivated and bred within Europe, um, within European borders, um, uh, I still felt like quite nervous about carrying plant species because I'm from <coughs> Australia and you can't bring plant species in and out. So there was like that kind of like politic of bringing this plant, what it means to bring like um, a biological material into a country, but also just like that it has a tag on it that says atom bomb. And so there's just like these, <laughs> these layers of, um, that kind of came with it. And um, I'll kind of go into that in a little bit. I'm trying to keep it short because I can go, I can go like full mind map. <laughs> um, so anyway, what, what I, I started growing this rose in my garden. Um, I started growing this rose in my garden in Stoke Newington and started thinking <coughs> about what to do with it. And I um, kind of developed this project that has become, that, that um, is called How to Make a Bomb. And it has involved me learning how to graft from this single rose that I have um, and propagate further specimens of this rose. Um, and I've been working on that for about a year now. Um, and um, and I've been documenting my attempts. Sorry, I'm not very good with PowerPoint. Um, I've been documenting my attempts as I go um, with cuttings to start with, um, and referencing these kind of early botanical drawings um, because this interest, this history of botanical. Um, the power, global power structures um, with reference to botany is a key part of my research. Um, so visually kind of referencing that through my drawings. Um, my cutting so far, it's, I've, I've had many more failures than successes, but I, that's kind of part of it because whilst, I'm, whilst I've been doing this process of propagating and having successes and failures and kind of like becoming very invested in the process of um, creating more of these plants, um, I've been simultaneously researching the history of the creation of the first atomic weapons um, and nuclear science in general. And so I do have now um, three plants in total and um, there will hopefully, there will be more. And the idea is that these plants along with the publication that I'm making that's called How to Make a Bomb will be distributed um, and planted throughout Britain. Um, either through guerrilla gardening or through um, working with organisations such as Art Action UK, working with um, Warren and I have been kind of talking about some ideas about how we could work together on this. Um, but basically that this plant will be distributed with this pamphlet so that people could continue to propagate their own rows. And um, I'm doing this alongside parallel research into the recurring... Um, this recurrence of Cold War era fear mongering in the media and by politicians, um, and thinking about gardening um, as a soothing mechanism um, that could be used as a kind of therapy against um, rapid media fear. Um, so that's kind of the project in a nutshell um, how to make a bomb. And I sort of just make sure that I've not missed over anything absolutely vital. Um, so just to expand um, on my kind of research, I could, I'm going to keep it brief because I could go on this, on this for a very long time and why this might r relate to this um, systematic framework within which Fukushima is such a kind of vital element of that I guess um, what Kari was talking about earlier about like trying to, how art can be used to, sorry, I, I'll keep it very short, but how art can be used to break down um, like quite powerfully to break down single incidents um, and single geographies that are often used in like the discourse of what is nuclear, like a nuclear country or um, a nuclear bomb um, that can be quite stifling and can, people can move on from them to actually look at the nuclear as something that's much more dispersive. So um, I've been using the atom bomb rose as a means of exploring the concept of gardening itself within a broader framework of control over what is considered wild um, and looking at the power structures of the nuclear. So um, I guess um, one key aspect of this project is that 
whilst this rose was being uh, released in 1953, that was the year that Britain was conducting its um, tests in Australia and Maralinga, its disastrous nuclear tests, um, within what was considered to be um, by the British government and by uh, the Australian government to be a wasteland um, and uncultivated um, part of Australia and and so such incredibly disastrous um, tests were conducted in these areas um, and there's just a quote that kind of carries that on um, that the supply minister Howard Deal said England has the know-how we have the open spaces much technical skill and a great willingness to help the motherland between us we should help build the defenses of the free world and make historic advances in harnessing the forces of nature so I guess I'm interested in these tests um, as being a kind of some of the last throes of empire gardening or trying to kind of control um, what was considered to be wilderness. Um, and thinking about how that form of like an abstracted view of what gardening can be on, on a colony, um, how that can be seen in like a very broad way, such as in a global sense, um, but can also kind of be looked at in terms of gardening the like the landscaping movement of cutting of actually like enclosing gardens um in, enclosing territory how that and just i would i did a residency at cove park which is right near where the entire nuclear arsenal was kept and how i couldn't kind of go into those areas so i guess just like looking at mapping of the world and um thinking about kind of the a very broad way of looking at global power structures to do as a gardening technique to a kind of middle like this. Um, going back down to actually like a small garden plot that you might have in a, um, in a somewhere in Brixton, um, or down to the actual cultivation of a specific plant, the manipulation of a plant. So roses, um, the manipulation of roses over the last 200 years has involved primarily um, natural roses are flat and um, through cultivation, through human cultivation, they've been turned into globe shapes which actually stop bees from being able to access the pollen and make those plants primarily dependent on human cultivation for them to exist. And so there are kind of just interesting parallels that are being done that I'm kind of trying to weave my way into to understand um, how this specific rose with its obscure name can be used as a vessel to view bigger power structures um, that... Um, it can be linked to incidents like Fukushima, can be linked to how, um, um, to, yeah, to, to, I think, do this. <laughs> um, and before I kind of carry on, I think I should probably wrap it up there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's actually fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Curator, writer, and researcher based in London. And he's a um, PhD candidate at Portsmouth um, Art Department. Um, and his uh, pra practice based curatorial research project will uh, investigate the relationship between the nuclear landscape of the Blackwater Estuary, and um, Essex, isn't it? Yeah, yeah Essex, yeah. Uh, home to the Bradwell Nuclear Power Station and its com communities and technologies. Um, in two, is that 2015? Uh, I think 2017. Uh, um, Warren uh, participated in residency program with Arts Catalyst and SR in Hokkaido, Japan, to research a nuclear power and alternative energies. Um, he initiated alongside uh, James Ravinet, yeah. Uh, a research-led project institute for the recognition of peripheral interests. So, um, um, so we'll be taking. Now. Well, thanks for yeah, thanks for inviting me, Carrie, and for everyone for um, showing up. Uh, so yeah, my project, I, I guess, bringing it back to a kind of local context to to here, I guess, near nearby London. Um, my project. Um, I just started my PhD uh, September, so um, this project is one that I've been working on with a 
a collaborator of mine, uh, James Rowe, who made for some time around the Blackwater Estuary, which is in Essex. Um, but to, just to give it a bit of background on the, my PhD project, which a lot of this is kind of drawing from. Um, so, yeah, the, the project essentially aims to kind of examine how the uh, how nuclear's uh, lingering presence may permeate the daily experiences of its co-inhabitants and the transient visitors of the of the Blackwater Estuary. Um, and the result of this, um, I hope, will be a um, curated programme of contemporary art and events informed by research in the area. Um, and our collaborative artists and others to explore the estuary, its legacy and the future nuclear programmes within, within the area. Um, so I thought I'd just kind of give a really quick kind of overview of the context of the area, because there's lots going on. I think this is kind of the best way to make sense of the, of, of the context that I'm kind of operating within. Um, so the Blackwater Estuary is in Essex. Um, it's uh, east of Chelmsford and north of South End on Sea. It's about, I guess, 40 miles from where we are, um, 40 miles north uh, east. Um, so within that context, that is where the Babel Nuclear Power Station is, which is now um, decommissioned. It's just gone into care and maintenance which means that um, it will be sat there in a kind of, um, kind of uh, clad in aluminium for 70 years for its radioactivity or the, the radiation levels within it to kind of to, to, to lower to a safer level. Um, but also near there, where this little arrow is, is a community called the Athona community, which have been there since 1946. Now they're a, a kind of essentially an off-grid community um, kind of founded on Christian values by an RF chaplain called Norman Motley um, in 1946. So they predate the power station. And they're off-grid, they produce around 70 to 80 percent of their own electricity um, through renewables like uh, uh, their own wind turbine and solar panels. Um, but also this is sat on top of a um, an old airfield, so an old, uh, called Bradwell Bay airfield, which was constructed in 1941 and um, stopped it stopped in 1946, just after the Second World War. Um, offshore, there are wind turbines, um, Gunfleet Sands, and London Array. And the Lon London Array is the second largest offshore wind farm in in the world. Um, and dotted around the land, there's lots of other uh, sort of wind turbines. So within this kind of small area, you've got a kind of I guess a microcosm of energy production, consumption, disposable, all kind of operating in this really kind of close um, sort of area, you know, 40 miles from where we are. And I'll also mention um, an aside, but down south also there's another island called, Fal there's an island called Foulness Island, which is also uh, part of the Ministry of Defence. And on that island are kind of integral structures, which were a part of the atomic uh, research for the, the UK's um, uh, atomic um, and nuclear kind of arms. Uh, so there's also the Denji, this is the Denji um, nature, uh, nature Reserve that's been there, uh, well that's a such special scientific interest. Um, there's also oyster fisheries, so if you have any oysters in London you probably would have got them from here. And there's also Malden Salt, which is from here, so you have all of these different layers of kind of ecological, political, sort of energy production, consumption, disposal all kind of operate within this small context. And myself and uh, uh, James Rabinier, who I mentioned a little while ago, have been kind of working um, around this area for a while. And as a part of this, we went to Japan to kind of, I guess, research the ways in which other countries or how Japan sort of also reflects upon and deals with their own um, sort of energy infrastructure, particularly their nuclear energy. Um, Alongside this, I just want to show you just some images that, so these are all archival images that, uh, that, have, uh, that have collected over the past couple of years, which kind of show us different ways in which the power station is represented within the landscape and how, what that does. Um, so this is um, a, an image from the nuclear power station looking out over the estuary onto the Blackwater River. Um, and all these images, the majority of these images are from uh, the Burma Museum, which is just down the river, or down another river, just south uh, west of, of the estuary. And you also have these kinds of images, which kind of provide a more sort of idyllic, pastoral, picturesque 
you know, picturesque kind of um, way in which the landscape is kind of really sort of dominant within you know the landscape and it's always present on the horizon wherever you kind of stand in relation to it really um, but there was also protests in the area so this is a protest from 1986 um, this was when uh, the sort of NIREX, which is the Nuclear Industry Radioactive Waste Executive, um, in 1986 wanted to um, put load of all nuclear waste um, in the area and the locals protested and the uh, NIREX decided against um, putting the waste there. Um, but ironically now there is an intermediate level waste storage facility, an interim storage facility uh, in the area. Um, and there's also this other way of, you know, different ways of knowing the landscape, I guess, or different ways of kind of understanding the landscape, like kind of, um, you get the sort of situated knowledge of, you know, bird watchers or the situated knowledge of the fauna community, but you also get the sort of um, more, I guess, institutionalised or systemic um, knowledge systems, like a sort of science or nuclear physics. Or, um, so this kind of quantifying and measuring the safety of the area and the radioactive um, levels to sort of, you know, um, determine whether or not it's safe within that context. And this is how it sits today with um, the power station in the background. And it's one of the reactor buildings which has, this has probably taken about a year ago, uh, and that is the aluminium cladding which now um, is all over the structure. And that's how it will sit for 70 years until they dismantle it completely. And then you can see here the layers of history within the landscape. In, in front, you can see one of the pillboxes which was there um, uh, for, the, for the Second World War. Um, and also, this, this is another aspect that uh, is quite interesting to me at the moment, has been for a while. And this is something that myself and uh, James looked at in detail when we were in Japan, was this kind of ways in which, I guess, the nuclear industry tries to represent itself and how that, it tries to kind of frame itself and um, deliver certain aspects of information in a certain way. So this is a visitor center information booklet. It's framing the um, power station within this kind of a frame of a tree. It's almost like it's sort of, almost sort of naturalizing the structure almost, or, 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 or normalizing it within the, within the context of the landscape in which it's situated. And this is kind of an interesting, from a curatorial perspective, this was something that we were both interested in, is kind of how different forms of display or different ways in which to mediate um, certain sort of, it, certain kind of forms of information and what happens if you kind of, um, I guess, put different, um, different ways of knowing the same context next to one another within a, the framework of a visitor sector or an exhibition and what that does and what kind of conversation that might throw up. Um, so that's another map. I like maps, if you've not um, uh, So this is, uh, as well as um, this kind of past nuclear legacy of the area, there's also a, new, a proposed new nuclear program within, um, within the Blackwater estuary. Um, so there has been planning permission granted for there to be um, um, investigative works for a new nuclear power station next door to the old, the legacy power station, or the old power station, which is here. So as you can see, it's a massive area that they've got planning permission for, and on this area, they're doing kind of investigative works where they're drilling down and, and um, I guess, exploring or investigating the um, geological, the, the geologic makeup of the area to see whether it's a suitable place to kind of put or build another uh, nuclear power station. And it kind of sits in between the Athona community and the power station. Um, yeah, and this is with China, the China Nuclear, uh, China General Nuclear Power Group and EDF Energy. Um, I'm gonna swing, flow up something I'm running over. So that's, that's the, and this is all the invest, this is where the invest, investigative works are kind of being stored, where there's sort of loads and loads of these kind of uh, different, um, like a strata of, of, of soil where they're trying to sort of find out the suitability of the, of the, of the area. And you can see the power station in the background, and that's what it looks like. Um, I'm going to go up a couple more slides. Uh, so, this is a, the Athona community. I just want to kind of, because this is a kind of really interesting counterpoint to the kind of, to the, I guess, systematic industrial 
um, nuclear kind of uh, uh, sort of industry which is nearby. So the uh, the Afona community, this is how it stands today. Um, so they are a kind of Christian group that are open, that are open and welcoming to kind of all all sort of um, faiths or, or no faith at all. Um, they've been there since the forties. Um, it began in a sum, as a summer camp in the Second World War. As I mentioned, they produced their own electricity, uh, 70 to 80 percent of that, and the rest comes from sort of generators. So they're off grid. They also treat their own waste. So this is from a reed sewage system where they have kind of septic tanks two ch with two chambers, um, and then a reed bed tertiary system to kind of um, clean their own waste. So this kind of other counterpoint of um, inter intermediate level waste storage of the power station and this kind of more, more kind of, um, I guess, less scalable and more uh, uh, organic, for want of a better word, to kind of create a community around um, ways in which to produce your own en energy, take care of your own waste, and how that sort of, how, how they kind of sit in the same, sit in the same landscape or in the same context. And they're there because of this church, uh, this chapel. It's been there since um, two, 270 AD. It was the first uh, chapel, uh, first sort of ch uh, church that was there. And this is one of the main reasons why Fono are founded where they're founded. Um, I'm just quickly skim over this and, and open it up to this kind of conversation about having these sort of localized context or localized sort of situations, and then sort of opening it up and how we can do that. So I'm thinking about. Um, this is a mine in Namibia which, produce, which produces a large proportion of Britain's uranium. It's the Rossi mine in Namibia in Africa. But also the storage of uh, nuclear waste which also, which is in the, the Thorpe uh, facility in Sellafield and this is where Japan's nuclear waste gets. Um, Japan's nuclear waste travels to um, Sellafield, is then vitrified and then sent back to Japan. So these different ways that, you know, these aren't just kind of single issues which operate on a, just a localised level. They're part of this kind of um, international uh, sort, of, uh, sort of military industrial complex um, of the kind of nuclear industries. And this is the Tokai um, nuclear power plant in Japan, which is the first commercial nuclear power station of Japan, which was um, run on a UK-designed Magnox reactor. So again, this kind of other exchange of... Of, of, of you know knowledge or commerce or you know um, yeah and I'll just sort of finish off on the way in which I've been thinking about it is um, by uh, and I'm, really, I'm running quite a bit so I'll keep this brief is by um, uh, is by the uh, Frank Stanton Foundation Professor of Nuclear Security at Stanford University her name's Gabrielle Hecht and she um use this really interesting kind of conceptual framework to think about these sorts of things, which she calls interscalar vehicles. Um, and Hecht set, uh, states that an interscalar vehicle, and I'll quote Hecht here, are objects and modes of analysis that permit scholars and their subjects to move simultaneously through deep time and human time, through geological space and political space. Uh, what makes something an interscalar vehicle is not its essence, but its deployment and uptake, its potential to make political claims, craft social relationships, or simply open our imaginations. What happens when we treat empirical objects as interscalar vehicles, as means of connecting stories and scales usually kept apart? And my provocation is what happens when we think about curatorial projects or, you know, the atom bomb rows or, you know, other artistic practices as interscalar vehicles, you know, how... You know, how does that allow us to think about, um, you know, and think about sort of different time frames and different um, geographical locations? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a couple of questions to each um, participants to kind of uh, develop the conversation between uh, between us. So they think the Back to the 2011, because yeah. you know, um, since you know this is today is the the day of the um, disaster and unraveling of the disaster. Um, so um, initially, um, you you were in Japan yeah. at the time, yeah, and 
you um, you are already practicing as an artist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I just wondered, you know, what did you observe uh, about other artists' practice um, immediately after 2011? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, what was your immediate response. You know, so there are two questions in one. Mm -hmm. you know, so what was the other artist's yeah. response? So basically uh, as I was showing in the in the slide of the of the grieving curve of the Kubler Ross grieving curve, it happened that most of the people were paralyzed in, in, in many ways and they didn't know how to react. The people that were really kind of losing people or or died or lose, lost their houses. So, so they were in a different state and there was a reaction of, of different um, levels of kind of, not guilty, but uh, kind of mourning or suffering. So people felt uh, guilty when they were not as affected as other people and they tried to help. So many of the artists tried to, to raise funds uh, selling artworks for, for charitable uh, causes. But the thing is that at that time, the, the, the social networks like uh, Twitter and Facebook were, uh, I felt that they were quite poisonous in a way because people were like saying, uh, kind of uh, say that they were um, uh, donating or, so it was in a way uh, a, a time that many people were donating to say that they were donating, they were uh, human in a way. So relieving their own uh, guilty of, of not having been uh, so much affected by the by the earthquake or by the by the accident, so uh, in that sense, it felt like people were trying to uh, donate just for themselves rather than for, for well, of course, also then a lot of people went there to help as volunteers. Uh, my wife, who also went, she she was a, um, a practicing psych uh, psychiatrist at the time, so. They went uh, by the, uh, with the university all together and stayed uh, several days or weeks there. But uh, there was kind of this um, obsession uh, kind of mindset in the, at the time of, of uh, irrationally trying to help. And that, that was very important at the time, but at the same time, it mm, kind of mm, created a sense of, of uh, the people that were not helping at, this, at that moment were not <coughs> civilized people. And I think that um, uh, this created a big also um, uh, disruption between the two parts of society. The people that were a little bit more um, uh, disconnected uh, or having distance from, from the event itself or from nuclear uh, criticism. And uh, Eventually, I think it led into the to the change of political side from from the National uh, Liberal Party to no from the uh, to the centre right uh, centre left party that was uh, um, the main political party at the time into a change shift into back into the centre right wing uh, uh, political party. So I think instead, like in the three months past of that. It was that kind of chaotic, uh, very um, yes, um, yeah, nervous state of society. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and after that, in different time scales, many artists like Chimbom, that some of them reacted very sharply, like almost like media or uh, activism. Many other uh, two two times to start dealing with the, uh, with the Fukushima. I also it took me three years to start dealing with it, and eventually for, for some of the works, I decided not to um, publish them until twenty years because yeah uh, the reason that I explained. So I think de depending on the artist, uh, but definitely many of the artists changed uh, uh, shifted their perspectives and politicality. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, from um, my observation from away from Japan, mm -hmm. um, I think at 2011 really marks quite a stark um, point mm -hmm. in, in relation to art, mm -hmm. um, yeah. particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, because before uh, 2011, um, again, it's a you know, huge generalization, but um, the political art was, you know, 
virtually non-existent. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, yeah, uh, all the political art has been kind of been undone and been crushed. You know, but, uh, and then 1980s, basically, all the kind of ec econo you know, economical development and advancement of technology really sort of took over. You know, so, um, um, there was no kind of um, urgency to politicize, you know, or kind of engage with any uh, politics uh, from the artist perspective. But I'm that uh, guilty generation of uh, carefree, um, you know, uh, 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 student era, and you know, uh, in the post, you know, and graduate, uh, uh, you know, enjoying, you know, um, the period. You know, so it's it's kind of quite interesting to think, to observe that. In a big, you know, change shift of the, the whole of the you know, art uh, industry. But um, I want to ask now, sort of shifting from that kind of background, 2011. Um, uh, <coughs> so Warren, um, you went to Japan 2017. 17. 17 yeah. Yeah, so there was a quite gap in, from uh, 2011. Yeah. But um, with your research. Um, Already started in mm -hmm. 2011. Yeah. yeah. Um, was there any sort of um, kind? Of, obviously, you eventually went to Japan, mm -hmm. you know, so there must have been some interest uh, to get to that point. But I just want to ask a question about you know uh, your perception of what happened in 2011 around mm -hmm. Fukushima, and in relation to your particular research. Well, so the interest, I guess, from of Japan came out of the black water, essentially, you know, this kind of, I guess, uh, so that project started 2016, so we started to kind of research the area, um, but I guess it was the, it was that context which then informed the interest in the nuclear, which then opened up the, you know, the issues around Fukushima, um, you know, and I think, oh, so I guess, I don't, I don't know what my kind of understanding was of the disaster prior to me going, only that which I had seen through artist projects like Chid Pong, like From the Wind, and through you know, um, Shuji Akari's work. And, um, so I get it was more just knowing that it was an awful disaster, not only in the context of you know, the, the Daiichi power plant, but from the, the, the tsunami. You know, it's kind of devastating aspect. So I guess the my understanding is that the implications of the tsunami l left a kind of delayed effect for the, for the kind of impact of the, the kind of the evacuation of the area due to the kind of fallout. So, um, you know, I, the, only, the only way I see it is a complete, you know, devastating blow on all levels, you know. Um, but we had, you know, some great uh, and amazing people showing us around um, Japan. Um, Sort of Kota Takeuchi took us, who's an artist based in Iwaki in Fukushima Prefecture, he took us around um, right up to the exclusion zone. So we got to see uh, areas which were just about to have their evacuation order lifted, like Tomioka uh, Tomio Town. Mm -hmm. um, so we got to see, I guess, firsthand the way that, uh, you know, the, the, from, from a kind of communities um, that I may not have had the opportunity to kind of chat with or meet before kind of them trying to rebuild their lives so essentially you can still, <coughs> still see because of the evacuation or the, the uh, you know the, the devastation that the tsunami left behind you know? um, so I'm not really answering the question or anything, but I guess it's kind of it's from a very different place because the way in which um, Japan has to deal with or has had to deal with its own nuclear the, the legacy the nuclear legacy that's been left there you know um, for you know decades, um, it's very very different to Britain. Mm -hmm. You know we've um, and that was one of the that was one of the sort of main drivers of the residency to kind of get a sense of how different um, countries have had to deal with their own nuclear legacy, whether that's through no fault of their own or or not. You know and how that might allow us to how that might I guess inform our own project in some way or um, give us a broader and more international understanding of the, of the sort of nuclear industrial military kind of complex because it isn't just localised and it's kind of a broader, um, more enveloping uh, thing which, is, which permeates everywhere, you know, you 
chances are you turn the plug on and it may be powered up nuclear power, you know, so it's kind of, it is ubiquitous. Um, but in many different, in many different yeah. levels. So you, you sort of talked about difference now, mm. but I uh, noted when you talked about um, Othola Os community, mm -hmm. yeah, um, situated very close to the mm -hmm. uh, nuclear plant, um, where um, I think a lot of uh, Fukushima you know, area, uh, um, my understanding is that there are lots of uh, kind of returner ideologies, you know, ideologically kind of uh, green uh, farmers, you know, who act prior to the uh, uh, accident uh, were living in the vicinity of the plant, you know, because of the idyllic location uh, and because there was no other sort of alternative industry, and so um, uh, some uh, farmers that <coughs> lived within the exclusion zone, uh, precisely, you know, were in a way kind of affected even more so emotionally um, uh, because of that the gap you know existed between so and so I kind of saw that map that you have um, shown and I thought it was quite in interesting you know that um, kind yeah. of perception of the place. Yeah. Was it I d was the area around where the plant was idyllic because people didn't want to live like that, you, you couldn't build up cities around it. Are there laws mm. about that? Not no. really. It is, but I, I think again, you know, this is I, I haven't done this proper research, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> the um, the area that I have you know, looked at, you know, both here as well, also uh, in Japan, is that the, um, the, the plants are built in very specific places. You know, um, obviously, it needs to be close enough to the sea so that you can actually obtain cooling you know, water, um, but also um, it, uh, it can't be too close to, say, like a place like London, mm. I mean, although it's very close, <laughs> because if you consider, you know, mm. 40 kilometers, yeah, uh, you know, where Fukushima and Tokyo is, you know, 200 kilometers, you know, so um, it's very close, you know, but um, a lot of those places, I, um, I kind of observe that it, it's sort of trying to be away from the busy places, you know, and, and also the place where no other alternative major industry is thriving. So therefore, it's providing jobs for the local mm -hmm. community and also, you know, enough land around. You know, so there's a kind of, um, yeah, so the um, right landscape yes. and that sort of demography that, um, Obviously, there to be chosen as a place for those you know, places to be built, and, and so obviously there is a different context of you know, difference. Uh, but I just wondered whether, um, when you visited, have you seen any of those kind of similarities? Um, yeah, totally. Like you, you get in, you know, like all the nuclear power station in the UK, like there's a sort of. Uh, academic, I guess, called, his name's Andy Blowers, he talks about this, uh, this kind of idea of what he calls a like, pr proliferalisation, Hor horrible kind of way, you know, in terms of like, it's not a very lovely word, but I mean, this notion of, you know, something being sort of economically marginal, geographically marginal, kind of, mm -hmm. and, and, and somewhere where, like from, in Bradwell, I don't know, um, Anganita might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but in terms of the village that are there, the, the, the people that have lived there have benefited hugely from the power station. So a second nuclear power yeah. station is welcome with open arms in some respects because it will bring jobs, it will bring security, it will bring, you know, uh, and the, the first power station has uh, done wonders for their own livelihoods. So why wouldn't you? You know, the, the kind of, the, the issues around, yeah. you know, long-term e ecological impact or, you know, um, the, the, the issues of, of, of waste, of storing waste, they're not really, um, it's that, the, these, these, these notions of scale that you were talking about, yeah. are not really, I guess, at the forefront of people's minds. It's more, you know, how can I take care of my kids and my kids' kids, yeah. rather than sort of how yeah. can we worry about where this waste is going to go, although it's sitting above ground, and it will be for hundreds of years because the UK in particular haven't got a, a geologic waste depository to store our waste and neither has Japan. 
at least Japan is further along with its <laughs> underground research facilities. But you know, so you don't, um, those aren't the concerns which, in my mind, are at the forefront of people's minds, you know? Mm. And that's the, it's similar in Japan, and geographically speaking, the power stage is a very, a, a friend in place in a very similar way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting because in Japan it's also the same. It's like uh, usually the pop. So when I did the, the the series of works that I shoot every single mm -hmm. nuclear pop, so I have to travel, uh, of course, obviously across the country. And it's interesting because all these places are like very nice landscapes. Like it's full of of, of natural uh, resources. There is the sea. You have mountains. You have forests, and there is no like highways. So it's like very picturesque mm -hmm. areas. So th it comes like very striking, this kind of opposition. And then of course, these areas are usually like very marginal or, or at least far from big uh, cities. And then usually there are rural areas that have less of income. And uh, yeah, you can see that there is a kind of a very, um, in a way, uh, uninformed uh, choice of the people that, what. Well, Many of the places they had um, they had chosen by themselves to mm. to to welcome the, the mm. facilities. Then uh, after the after the earthquake, many of the people kind of divided uh, were divided by uh, in their opinions. But yeah, primarily people were welcoming with open arms uh, because yeah, there were most of the the people living in the village were working there. So mm. for them is the, the the company, you know. So. Yeah, I think there is, is, is that kind of a, 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 a more subtle alienation of people's yeah and, and informed choices. Right. Um, there's so much more I'd like to actually ask, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna um, kind of ask final question and, and start off with um, Gabriella. Yeah. Um, Art is a obviously very powerful tool uh, for communication and articulation of ideas. And the you know artists can articulate you know ideas perhaps through the art, which uh, you know it was mentioned you know the journalist you know or the uh, other um, sort of language you know perhaps couldn't access, but also. Um, at the same time, you know that power can be also manipulated and used in all sorts of different directions. You know, so I'm just kind of wondering, uh, particularly with the uh, uh, atom bomb, Rose, and the, you, the way that you, you want to proliferate <laughs> the the um, the Rose to yeah. be, and, and by the way, uh, hopefully one of the Rose. Uh, can come to my garden. Oh. Well, we are going to do some kind of celebration <laughs> event around oh, that as well. Really. So the art action is going to be hosting the. Um, uh, so I'm kind of slightly uh, giving away the, you know, my take on this you know, uh, issue. But um, so there's a kind of two-edged thing, isn't it? Because you know, you're, you're kind of you know, dealing with that um, rose, you know, beautiful rose, you know, but with the, uh, carrying the name of atom bomb. Yeah, and you're going to proliferate that uh, to increase the number of it, you know. Um, you know so I, I think it's really kind of interesting, but also quite dangerous. That it could be area. kind of like, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. like, like aestheticizing, mm -hmm. like by, do you, is that what you mean, like that it could by, um, probably, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, you can, you can kind of read it both ways <coughs> as well, can I think what's interesting about, I, I mean, I guess that is why also, like, initially the project, um, the publication that I'll be producing with the Rose, I think, is important mm -hmm. as um, providing some context. Mm -hmm. But I do also feel like I am working with found material. Um, my action is um, to bring that material into. Um, that, that I didn't call the rose that name, so I'm kind of drawing a focus to this horticultural phenomenon. Um, and what I found really interesting through my gardening and through my research is how, when I found, like sometimes when in my research, when I found a, a plant that has a, a name like that 
a plant that's been made in the 80s that's called Falklands, um, and then contacting like a society for fuchsias, there's a fuchsia, and then, then being like, oh no, that has absolutely nothing to do with Falklands War. And so a kind of denial of um, possible connections. Um, and so I do think there's, there is kind of like an interesting like, way of working with um, this material that already exists and then kind of raising questions about why it might historically have been called. It takes, um, you, it takes contemplation, it takes, um, it takes investment, like a time investment and a personal investment. Um, and I find, and I think other people would agree, that, that, that gardening provides a space for contemplation. And so I hope that simply by tending, if someone was to have a plant and to tend that plant, um, and the process of gardening involving kind of um, by caring for something that is called an atom um, bomb, that that will provide a, a space for those kind of contradictions to be confronted, um, that you are caring for something with such a name. But I guess thinking about, I guess I'm thinking if this plant was in the hands of someone who was just like really pro atomic warfare, I guess I haven't really <laughs> thought of that. And that it's just like really celebrating that in the garden, but then like, I guess that's interesting and in that opens up like another, yeah. in terms of, um, if, if that were to happen, like I would really want to meet that person. <laughs> because like there are, there are relationships of like, when you are gardening something, you are kind of exerting control over what plants exist, get to exist there, and what plants don't, and the, like roses, you need to prune them back really harshly, and yet they're kind of constantly kind of pushing outside of your control, and there's, so there's such like a interesting dynamic there. And so if someone was like potentially like seeing this rose again, as maybe it was originally as a celebration of nuclear warfare, um, then I'd be really interested in how their relationship with that plant was actually yeah. acted out. Um, but yeah, I guess I haven't really thought that it could be a celebratory thing, but maybe it's because I just exist within a very close bubble of people who are not <laughs> yeah. particularly pro-nuclear warfare. Like they might, they of course, like it's, it's more common, I guess, that you would find people who would be pro-nuclear power, but pro-nuclear warfare is such a, <laughs> but maybe they'd be big gardeners, who knows. Yeah, the, the, the reason I'm sort of bringing up this question again, and come back to Joy, is that um, you, I'm sure you are aware now, particularly uh, in Japan, uh, that you know, art is, um, in a way, is perceived as a powerful tool to um, articulate, communicate, um, um, propaganda, <laughs> um, or you know, a particular. Um, strain of ideas from you know both sides of uh, spectrum, political spectrums and um, but um, this is where the money talks in so we're talking about art action you get not get any funding, you know, but uh, there's a lot of money it's been um, thrown at art at the moment and um, so I'm just kind of um, ask one just short question but basically the um, how how do you observe um, or you know, how do you kind of situate yourself within that landscape of you know tempting offers, or, you know, or um, you know a big funding uh, coming in, and you know, uh, and to then you know, and so one obviously is uh, before you even you know um, kind of asking questions. So how do you know you know where that you know funding comes from, yeah. you know, and how do you sort of deal with that kind of um, yeah. Situation. Yeah, I think that's a very uh, crucial uh, question for artists. Yeah, but, but yeah. So um, there is also uh, a little bit different. But in London, you have um, what's the name of the art foundation that is in North London? Yes, South London. So so yes, uh, a very yeah typical question in London is uh, imagine that the Zamanovich Foundation wants to fund you for a big project of uh, 30k uh, for a show and, and in, in Venice, I don't know, 
So yeah, in, in a way, it's, it's like that. So well, uh, when your political um, uh, uh, stance kind of uh, comes in opposition to, to that, how would you? There are people that say like, well, you could use that money to, in a way, uh, subvert that or kind of make an anti-advertising campaign, for example. But in the end, I think virtually that's impossible. Uh, you you get caught into that. So from my, yeah, I think that uh, and what in, in Japan in terms of where does the money come is is uh, something very difficult to say. It's like where does this electricity come? So in that case, if imagine if you want to be like very really puritan, if this energy comes from from a nuclear power plant, you are paying them, you are helping them. So that means that we are also, in a way, part of the of the of the, um, the team. So uh, I think rather than a, a thing of yes and no, probably something like a gray uh, gradation of where do you situate yourself. And, and so the line between mm, uh, good or evil typically probably is more like a gray scale. And, and the thing is that where do you put your your line? So yeah, and, and that's a, a crucial question. But yeah, from my point of view, I think that um, yeah, funding that comes what well, directly, uh, I think, from my point of view, is something that um, yeah, artists may want to avoid because uh, all uh, revolutionary or political uh, yeah uh, yeah like um, I don't know. Uh, uh, Fidel Castro or Mozart or, or Stalin, all of them have like very big ideas, but in the end they ended up like that. So it's very difficult to kind of um, resist to to the to the uh, effects of power and money. So I think, yeah, um, yeah, we, you you need to resist, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so um, as the time is kind of running out, I'd like to open um, you know, this conversation to the floor. And, um, but because the time is limited, I want to also give people to you know, talk to each other and also talk to us. Um, um, I, I can only take maybe two questions. I'm just wondering, what with your connection to the disaster in general and also as an artist, do you feel that it's your duty to talk about these things um, as being someone supposed to tie to it as well as being an artist? I'm sorry, uh, before being an artist, what did you say? So I just said, like, as someone who is closely connected okay. to the disaster mm -hmm. and someone who's an artist as well, do you feel like it's your duty to talk about these things within mm -hmm. your artistic practice? Mm -hmm. Like, does it help you kind of navigate through what's happened as well? come to terms with it, because I feel like you, yeah. your part point that was something that came through a lot was how it helped you navigate through yes, something yes. like that. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I feel, yeah, like both, uh, like a social kind of responsibility, and at the same thing, at the same time, something that uh, I, some of the projects that I started for my son, for example, because right. I wanted him to have some information yeah. when there may not be none. So, so that's it's it's a uh, being an artist. I think it's very difficult to draw a line between your social status and your your I mean your public uh, thinking and your personal thinking. It's all linked together, and uh, both permeate to each other. So, I would say that yeah, I feel like there is a certain responsibility, but um, that uh, in a way is like activity and and, and production is like. All in one is yeah. Okay. Another question. Um, this is for Gabriella. But um, gen so like genetic mutation and as Joy said, cancer things uh, from nuclear radiation are definitely like an aftermath. Do you think that in some ways by introducing these kind of foreign species that whilst they're very beautiful, they kind of represent that kind of mutated environment that happens to the kind of like the when you bring foreign into the kind of the garden that you're planting them in, do you think they kind of represent that kind of genetic infiltration? Um or is that a fascinating thought? 
So I guess I don't really think of this rose as so much, except for the time when I had to bring it across borders. Um, mm. I didn't think of it so much as like um, a foreign breed of rose, simply because it is like not that different as a, at, like at, from a modern garden roses in general. It's like a floribunda rose. It's um, of a very similar family tree than most garden roses available um, now that are like have been bred in Europe for the last 200 years. Um, so, no, I haven't really considered, I've, I've actually thought of it more in terms of like Britishness um, and Europeanness because of the way that it has been bred has followed um, a very kind of European model of what a rose should look like. Um, but, so, sorry, to get my head around your question, um, the genetic mutation that it brings into the British garden, um, as I mirror... Mean, it been partly, I thought it was kind of more foreign to the European horticulture than it was. And I kind of, you talked about kind of Australia, for example, where I know there have been issues in Australia with certain species. With certain species coming in. Exactly. And uh, um, by bringing it into, a, I, I, I thought it was more of a kind of foreign environment it was brought into. So interestingly, it was in 1955 introduced into Australia. And I haven't been able to find any, um, like anywhere where it is still in Australia. Um, but I just, I'm oh, sorry, to, so the genetic mutation as mirroring the sort of genetic mutation that happen mm, in, like a, in, a nu in a nuclear like a disaster. Like an alien species kind of representing that kind of um, genetic fallout that occurs in a disaster. Um, I haven't thought about it like that because I've been so focused on um, a very kind of human-led manipulation and a, and a kind of desire for like um, a controlled manipulation of plants as opposed to something that um, happens uh, like that doesn't, that isn't like intended um, as happens in nuclear fallout. Um, but that is interesting, I'll think about that um, as a kind of side note to that controlled manipulation. Can I just make a quick yeah. comment? It would be lovely to try and subvert that. Do you think the seeds would grow? The well, that was interesting because they carry the trace of previous roses. Yeah. Yeah. So I had, um, when I actually presented my work last as part of um, the nuclear culture uh, research group in November, I was waiting on one rose hip that I had <laughs> that I'd been really lucky to get and I'd researched and found that it as a rose hip, a rose hip if it matures that then I could plant those, incubate those seeds and plant them and I would get a mutated version of the Adam rose that would have throwbacks to previous um, like family of the rose, but um, bird ate it. No, squirrel. <laughs> squirrel. It was a squirrel, wasn't it? Because I like complained to Kauri. Um So I was thwarted yet again. I've kind of taken this being thwarted over and over again in my attempts to do this as like um, part and parcel of the project. My failures to make an atom bomb are just kind of mirroring. So they the might be growing somewhere. The squirrel took the rose. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Fallout. I love this idea. Yeah. yeah. The, but the logic of this kind of this in, almost an invasive species, it kind of you've spoken about before about the kind of colonial or imperial undertones yeah. of this. Yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely still, it's still, in my research. That's a kind of you know a different. Yes, yeah, a similar kind of way of thinking about it, but you know. So but, functioning both ways, mm -hmm. as like a rose coming as certain types of species bring being brought to um, Australia and either going rampantly wild and causing mass problems um, that carry on today, very much so, or else um, the symbology of bringing garden plants, particularly the rose, to Australia as being kind of a longing for an attempt to transform the landscape um, as you see it to something that reminds you of um, the motherland. Um, so that's something that's happened and that kind of ties into it, but also working the other way around how plants then change their meaning depending on which context they're in. So um, wattle, which is golden wattle, which is the Australian national flower, being brought over to Europe and then going um, rampant in southern Italy and then it being taken up by the communist movement and because it was it spread so prolifically that it was seen as a democratic flower and being taken on as the flower for International Women's Day and how that now we can find that on International Women's Day at Mimosa. 
So like, I am really interested in how plants can take on different meanings, political meanings and otherwise, depending on which context they're in. And I think the Annabon Rose as a symbol of Britishness, even though it's specifically not from Britain, um, can carry that. I mean, it'd be interesting to see if it ever went wild, but I don't know how that would really happen. I need to look into that a bit more. Maybe it is through the squirrel. I guess it went off the market because of the 1957 Sabbath disaster. That was in Britain. It went that was in Britain. It wasn't really on it the market in Britain. In Britain. I, not that oh. I can find. Okay. Not in, I mean, maybe it was, but there's not so much research about it. Maybe because of some shame about it. Mm. Or maybe I just need to dig deeper. That's probably the case. <laughs> Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, the last question. question. Are you thinking of grafting the Atom Bomb Rose with other symbolic roses? Um, oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> that's been, like, from my garden in Berlin, of all these war roses, my partner just keeps being like, make the super rose. <laughs> and I'm just, I, I'm kind of resisting it, but maybe I will in, in the future. I'm more interested in just the idea of, like, bringing this particular species back. Um, yeah. that, I think that's another project to be done with other roses or plants yeah. that have specific meaning. Mm -hmm. But I have teamed up, well not teamed up, I have kind of like managed to sneak my way into David Austin Roses that they're going to teach me some grafting techniques this summer, um, which is with these guys going to like see ways that, that could maybe be launched. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so you, do you think of getting back the rose to the primitive species you mean? Um, that's, n I'm more, I think it, Maintaining it as it is, uh -huh. because it's almost extinct, mm -hmm. is going to be kind of my primary aim. But any kind of side things of like, for example, getting the seeds from the rose hip, which will show its yeah. previous, probably not back to how it was as like a, a wild rose, but mm -hmm. will show its kind of previous parentage, mm -hmm. will be interesting. Yeah, it will be interesting. Um, but I'm kind of more interested in the idea of like proliferating this particular spe uh, species um, of rose as it is, as it looks. Um, as a kind of vehicle for just thinking about um, nuclear power structures around the mm -hmm. world. And I think it in its pure form, mm -hmm. keeping it simple is probably the best way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so um, going back to that nuclear power structure, uh, so all that thought. Yeah, and it, it, um, there's so much question I'm sure you, know, you are itching to ask. And what I would like to suggest now is that, that uh, we're going to close this Conversation between us and question for now, uh, but you're you know, more than welcome to come and approach us. And also, you know, we have food and drinks. And so, so I, I think if we could sort of uh, yeah, break up, you know, for kind of more casual uh, talk. And I'd also like to highlight that, uh, that there's some you know, students from uh, University of Arts, uh, but also Goldsmith uh, and. So there's lots of you know, interesting people. You know, so obviously, you know, speakers are really amazing, but also amongst yourself, I'm sure you find really interesting <laughs> contacts. You know, so please you know, speak to each other. Yeah. 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 Yeah.